Hello everyone, my name is David. Today we're going to take a look at another horrible and creepy case with you. There have been many serial killers in this world who have committed very heinous crimes. These killers have brutally murdered many innocent people without thinking. Today's story is also about one such crazy serial killer who not only did he kill men and women, but did not spare even breastfeeding children. This serial killer is from India who spread terror in the entire Bombay city in the 1960s. Bombay, or today's Mumbai, is one such city. One who never sleeps is always on the run. But in those days, the terror of this serial killer spread so much that as soon as the sun set, silence spread throughout Bombay. Today's story is a bit long, but I hope that if you listen until the end, you'll stay with us throughout the video. The story begins in July 1968 when the Bombay police receives information about a murder in Poissar area near Borivali. Upon reaching the spot, they find a man's body outside a shanty, brutally attacked with what seemed like a sharp and solid metal weapon. Another woman and a child were inside the shanty. The woman, unable to see anything due to darkness, couldn't provide much information. The police register a case, but conduct a lax investigation. Initially thinking it might be due to some personal rivalry, they soon discover another murder a few kilometers away in Malad on the same night. A man sleeping outside another shanty had been viciously assaulted. At that time, police did not even realize that there could be some connection between these two murders. Approximately seven days later, in Malad, on the Western Express Highway, a husband and wife were found murdered along with their two-month-old child, sleeping in a hut. When the police arrived, they were shocked to witness the scene of death. The killer had attacked all three with a sharp object on their heads. But what worked in favor of the investigation was that after the murder, the killer left his weapon and jacket right there. The police found a thick iron rod from the crime scene, which was sharp and twisted from the front. Subsequently, the police get involved, and now they recall two murders that happened a week ago, where the victims were also killed in a similar manner with an attack on the head. For the first time, the police suspect that all these murders are connected. Then, the police send the weapon and jacket for fingerprint analysis to find any clues. However, no fingerprints are found because during those days, Mumbai experienced heavy rainfall and both the weapon and jacket were found outside the hut, so the rainwater washed away all the fingerprints. The news of the murder of three members of the same family here has caused panic throughout the area, putting considerable pressure on the police as well. Now the Mumbai police have initiated the search for the killer, but so far no progress has been made. Just four to five days after this incident, a school teacher in the Hanuman Naga area of Kandivali is also murdered in a similar manner during the night. Subsequently, several more murders occur but the police find no clues to the killer. Until now, all the murders share three commonalities. First, all the murders occurred between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. Second, the method of killing was the same, a lethal attack on the head with a sharp weapon. Third, all the victims were poor and lived in slum areas, indicating the involvement of a serial killer in these homicides. Due to all these incidents, so much terror spread throughout Mumbai that as evening fell, all shops, parks, restaurants, and markets started closing. Even the never-sleeping Mumbai would fall into silence as soon as evening descended. As darkness fell, people hurried to close their home windows, glass, doors, everything, and some even stopped sleeping outside or on the balcony. Many took it upon themselves to protect their families, roaming in groups with sticks and rods throughout the night. However, this led to a problem where whenever these people saw a lone beggar in that area and had even a slight suspicion, they would beat him. As a result, many innocent people barely survived, and sometimes the police had to intervene to control the crowd. Despite all this, no benefit was gained, and one after another, murders were happening. Neither could anyone see the killer coming nor going. He silently entered the darkness, prayed, and left. In the meantime, Rumors spread among people that this is not a common human, but a magical being who, after killing people, disappears in the form of a parrot or cat, so neither anyone sees it coming nor going. The failure of the police also fueled these rumors, 
so people began to create all these stories. At that time, the commissioner of Mumbai police was E.S. Modak. There was also a lot of pressure on him to solve this case. When the local police failed to stop these murders, Commissioner Modak handed over the case to the CID. A special team was formed in the CID, led by DCP Ramakant Kulkarni. DCP Ramakant Kulkarni was appointed as the head of the crime branch in August 1968, and he was the youngest DCP in the crime branch at that time. However, when Ramakant Kulkarni was given this case, many officers in the crime branch opposed it, stating that such a sensitive case should not be given to him because he had just joined the CID and did not have much experience. Despite all these objections, the case was assigned to him. Well, after that, Ramakant Kulkarni formed a large team under his police command, and now about 2,000 police officers started patrolling those areas 24-7 to apprehend the killer. But there was no success. The police had not found any clues yet. In the meantime, an inspector from this team, named Vinayak Rao Wakatak, informed Ramakant Kulkarni that exactly two years ago, between 1965 and 1966, there was a similar series of killings. At that time, these incidents occurred in the shanties built alongside the municipal pipeline of the Eastern Express Highway in the outskirts of Mumbai, where poor people lived. During that period, an attack was carried out on 19 people while they were asleep, and nine of them died. The assailant had also used some sharp object to attack people's heads during the 1965 to 66 attacks, similar to the ongoing attacks. At that time, Inspector Vinayak Rao Vakatkar was in charge of Mulund Police Station. When he received information about these incidents, 24-hour patrolling began in those areas. One night, while Inspector Vakatkar and his team were patrolling the area, they saw a suspicious man openly wandering without fear, even though everyone else would retreat to their homes in the darkness. Inspector Vakatkar became suspicious, approached him, and asked for his name. The man identified himself as Raman Raghav. Upon searching him, they found a diary in his pocket with just two words written, Kalas and Katam. As Inspector Vakatkar delved into his history upon reaching the police station, he discovered several aliases, including Cindy Dalwai, Talwa, Anatambi, and Veluswami. Born in 1929 in the Agreshwar Nellur village of the Tirunelveli district in Tamil Nadu, Raghav had a penchant for theft from a young age. When he turned 20, he fled his village for Mumbai, worked for a few months, but couldn't abandon his thieving ways. One such theft led him into the hands of the police, and Raghav was sent to Baikala jail. After being released from jail, Raghav didn't reform. Instead, he resumed multiple thefts and dacoities. Despite serving a five-year sentence before, Inspector Wakatkar now questions Raman Raghav about nine recent murders. Raghav remains silent, enduring all torture inflicted upon him. When none of the torments affect Raghav, Inspector Wakatkar instructs him to leave Mumbai for two years, warning of imprisonment upon return. Despite Raghav's sudden departure, the series of attacks ceased. However, two years later in 1968, similar assaults began anew. Upon discovering the incidents of 1965 to 66 and details about Raman Raghav, Inspector Wakatkar becomes convinced of Raghav's involvement as he returns to Bombay after two years. He immediately retrieved all of Ram Raghav's records. These records contained Raghav's fingerprints photo and all related information. Subsequently, he distributed Raghav's photo to all police stations and issued an alert to apprehend him wherever he was seen. Now the entire police force was mobilized in the search for Ram Raghav. Meanwhile, on the nights of August 25th and 26, 1968, in Chincholi, Malad, Raghav murdered two individuals named Lalchand Yadav and Dular Yadav. Following this, a team from the crime branch arrived, and fortunately, they found the murderer's fingerprints at the scene. These fingerprints were then matched with Raman Raghav's file, confirming that both prints matched. It was now confirmed that Raman Raghav was indeed involved in this serial killing. However, Raghav was missing, and the police had adopted all measures to apprehend him. Every Mumbai police officer was interrogating with Raghav's photo in hand, but no success was achieved. 
once the police, while searching for Raghav, reached the outskirts of Poissar. When the police showed a photo of a woman named Manjulabai Dalvi, they immediately recognized her. She claimed to be Anna and mentioned seeing Raghav early in the morning when he went to fill water from the well. As soon as the police heard Manjulabai's story, they went on high alert. When asked if she knew where Raghav lived, she replied that she had no idea. She had seen Anna here a few days ago. Then the police inquired about Raghav's appearance and attire when she last saw him. Manjula described that in the morning, Raghav was wearing a blue shirt, khaki half pants, brown canvas shoes, and had an umbrella in his hand. Upon receiving this information, the Mumbai police immediately spread the message through wireless to all police stations to apprehend anyone suspicious matching that description. The police continued searching the area where Raghav was last seen throughout the day and night, but Raghav remained elusive. On the next day, August 27, 1968, Inspector Alex Filo spots a man near Bindi Bazaar wearing a blue shirt, khaki half-pants, and brown shoes. He holds a wet umbrella, indicating he's come from a place where it rained. However, there was no rain around Bindi Bazaar that day. Inspector Alex Filo suspects this might be Raman Raghav, but decides to confirm by approaching him. As Philo gets closer, he notices bloodstains on the man's clothes. Upon searching him, Philo finds two glasses, two combs, two scissors, a stand for lighting incense, soap, garlic, tea leaves, and two pieces of paper with numbers written on them. When asked for his name, the man responds, Cindy Dalwai. Philo recalls that Raman Raghav also goes by the name Sindhi Dalwai. Shortly after, he instructs him to accompany the police to the station, and Raghav complies without resistance. After reaching the police station, Alex Philo informs his senior that Raman Raghav has been apprehended. Upon hearing this, the crime branch team quickly arrives, examining his fingerprints first. Later, they match the fingerprints found at the Malad Chincholi murder spot. With both fingerprints matching on the same day, August 27, 1968, CID officials announced the arrest of Raman Raghav. The news of the capture of the serial killer, who had eluded the police for so long, spreads like wildfire, creating a celebration outside the Mumbai Police Commissioner and Crime Branch office. By evening, more than 2,000 people start celebrating and police commissioner E.S. Modak is so pleased with Raman Raghav's arrest that he announces a reward of 1,000 for Inspector Alex Filo. Now Raman Raghav has been caught, but the challenge before the police and the crime branch was how to make him confess to his crime because two years ago when he was interrogated, he did not speak. Anyway, after that, the interrogation started again and he was asked several questions, but he remained silent. The police knew that even resorting to violence would have no effect, so they asked him kindly to confess his crime, but he said nothing. Two days passed during Raghav's interrogation. The police tried every method with him, but he didn't open his mouth. Finally, exhausted, a police officer asked him if he needed anything. Without wasting a moment, two days later, Raman Raghav spoke for the first time, saying he wanted chicken. Then, from a nearby hotel, chicken was ordered for him and he was given it. Raghav ate the chicken on a plate in a few minutes. After that, he was asked again if he needed anything, and he said, I want another plate and more chicken. Again, chicken was ordered for him, and after the chicken finished, he was asked once again if he needed anything. He said he wanted coconut oil, a comb, and a mirror, and he also wanted a prostitute. While he desired to sleep with her, his request for a prostitute was denied due to legal reasons. However, Arrangements were made for coconut oil, a mirror, and a comb. Afterwards, he applied coconut oil to his hair and then gave himself a full-body massage with that oil. He also praised the fragrance of the oil. Later, he used a comb to style his hair, and for a long time, he observed himself in the mirror with a gentle smile. After a while, he turned towards the police and said, Now ask whatever you want to ask. When the police inquired about the ongoing murder cases in the city, Raghav responded, All right, I'll tell you everything. And then Raman Raghav began his story. 
He revealed that two years ago, in 1966, when he left Mumbai, he headed towards Pune and started engaging in thefts in places named Vadgaon, Dehu, and Talagayon. In Talagayon, he went to a tea shop and asked to make a strong cup of pure milk tea. However, the tea vendor added less milk and more water to his tea. Furious, he immediately decided to murder the tea seller. In the evening, when the tea shop closed, he started following him. However, in the meantime, the police arrived, caught him in a theft case, and sent him to Vadgaon jail for one and a half years. Raghav shared that when he came out of jail after a year and a half, he caught a train to Karyat, Maharashtra. After spending a few days in Karyat, he reached Borivali in Mumbai in July 1968. He engaged in several petty thefts there for the next few days. One day, near Dahisar Bridge, he found a motorcycle handle in front of a hardware store. He lifted it and took it to a blacksmith in Yogeshwari. He told the blacksmith to straighten the iron rod, add a slight bend at the end, and make it sharp. The blacksmith complied, and Raghav took his weapon and left. A night or two later, wandering in Poizar, he noticed a woman and her child sleeping in a hut. A man was sleeping outside, and it was pitch dark. Raghav approached the man, struck a powerful blow to his head with his weapon. The man screamed in pain, so Raghav struck again until he died. In the meantime, the woman inside woke up, saw the scene, and started screaming. Raghav fled and reached Malad. Around 3 a.m., he found a man sleeping on a cot outside a hut in Malad. He approached, repeatedly struck the sleeping man's head with his weapon until he died. After the man died, Raghav took off his watch and wore it. He then picked up a torch, a blanket, some peanuts, and a bag, collecting a total of RS-2262. Raghav explained that a few days later, as he was passing through Malad's Western Express Highway one night, he saw a hut in a secluded area. Climbing up from the back, he peeked inside to find a woman feeding her child. She wore a golden mangal sutra. Captivated by the gold, he waited there for the woman to sleep, but she stayed awake until 4 a.m. Undeterred, he returned for the next four nights, finding her always awake. On the fifth day, despite heavy rain, he went back with an umbrella. Inside, he discovered the woman asleep and her husband on another cot. He took out a knife, cut the rope, sealing the hut. Entering, he attacked the man with a sharp weapon, who died instantly. Then, he assaulted the woman, leading to her demise. In the process, the two-month-old child woke up crying. He didn't spare the baby, ensuring its death. Afterward, he came out of the slum, looked around to ensure nobody saw him, left his weapon and umbrella outside the shanty, and went back inside. He then removed the woman's necklace, placed it in his pocket, and as he attempted to undress her, an old lady appeared screaming. Startled, he left everything and fled. The next day, he went back to retrieve his weapons and umbrella, but found nothing as the police had sent a forensic team to collect his weapon and shield for fingerprint analysis. Later, when he attempted to sell his gold necklace, he discovered it was artificial, not gold. Raghav then went to his old friend Michael in Chincholi Malad, asking for a long iron rod to build a hut and dig the ground. Michael gave him a roughly four-foot iron rod, telling him to return it when the job was done. He left with the rod and never returned. Three to four days later, he arrived in Hanuman Nagar, Kandivali, where he saw a lone man sleeping in a hut. He left but returned the next day creating a small tunnel into the hut. After entering, he attacked the sleeping man with four to five blows to the head, causing his death. He took the dead man's watch, which had three to four pens in its pocket, and found five one-rupee notes after taking the money. With the loot, he left, carrying dal, ghee, wheat flour, and a stove. Later, he sold the watch for $1.30 at a shop. After that, he went back to the same blacksmith in Yogeshwari, where he had gone before. He had the same weapon, a rod he had obtained from his friend Michael, forged again. Three to four days later, he headed towards Borivali. There, he found a man sleeping alone inside a hut. He entered the hut, used his new weapon to attack the man several times, causing his death. Afterward, 
He took a beady and matchsticks from the deceased man's pocket, placed them in his pocket, and ate some of the food that was prepared in the hut. Then, after moving a short distance away, he saw a lone woman sleeping with her two children in another hut. He entered the hut, attacked the woman two to three times with his weapon, and the woman succumbed. The woman had a blanket covering her, and when he removed it, he discovered she was sleeping without clothes. Witnessing this scene reignited the monster within him, and he sexually assaulted the lifeless woman multiple times. Once satisfied, he left, consumed the remaining food in the hut, took the tea leaves, and fled, detailing similar gruesome acts in his confession. When the police questioned Raghav about the series of consecutive murders happening two years before, he admitted that yes, he had committed all those murders. Between 1965 to 66, he had committed approximately 24 murders, and in total, he confessed to 41 murders in his confession statement. He mentioned that the actual count could be more than 41, but currently, that's all he remembers. When asked why he killed so many people, he replied that they were all bad people and God had told him to kill them. Now that the police had his confession, it was crucial to find the weapon used in the murders, as the weapon played a significant role in proving him guilty in court. When the police asked Raman Raghav about the weapon he used for the murders and where it was, he took them to the jungles of Arya Road and retrieved the weapon from a bush. It turned out to be a sharp iron weapon and a knife. Subsequently, the police recorded the statement of the local blacksmith in Jogeshwari, where Raghav had crafted his weapon. They also took a statement from Raghav's friend Michael, building a strong case. Approximately 10 months after Raman Raghav was apprehended on June 2, 1969, Raghav's trial begins in court. However, as soon as the trial commences, defense attorney P.V. Pawar argues in favor of Raghav, claiming that Raman Raghav is not mentally sound. He asserts that whenever Raghav committed a murder, he was unaware of his actions and is unfit to defend himself against the allegations. Government prosecutor M.B. Bora, however, opposes all points raised by the defense. After hearing both sides, the court sends Raman Raghav to a Mumbai police surgeon for a mental health checkup, which lasts for the next three weeks. The surgeon examines Raghav's mental state and submits a report to the court stating that Raghav's mental condition is perfectly fine and he was aware of his actions. After considering this report and all evidence, Judge C.T. Dingra finds Raman Raghav, alias Cindy Dalwai, guilty and sentences him to death. After this, the case reached the High Court. There, in defense of Raghav, the argument was presented that his mental condition is not well. So, the High Court formed a team of three psychiatrists who conducted several interviews with Raman Raghav and stated in their report that Raghav is suffering from chronic paranoid schizophrenia. In this condition, a person is unaware of whether what they are doing is right or wrong. When this report was presented in court on August 4, 1987, the High Court changed Raman Raghav's death sentence to life imprisonment and sent him to Yerwada Jail in Pune. Then, eight years later, in 1995, due to kidney failure, Raman Raghav died in Sassoon Hospital. Even today, among all the notorious and infamous serial killers in the world, Raman Raghav's name is still included. In 2023, more than 50 years have passed since the incident, but many people and children who were in Mumbai during 1965 to 1968 still shudder remembering it. Because in those days, the entire Mumbai had only one name for terror, and that name was Raman Raghav. This was the story of a crazy serial killer, Raman Raghav. I hope you all enjoyed this story. If you liked the story, please like it. Subscribe to the channel, press the bell icon, so you don't miss any of my stories.